was born to two immigrant parents, statuses and paperwork and trying to become legal for my parents. Spirituality was something that really assisted me through that. I would get sad and I have little episodes of depression, but the suicide was kind of like muted in the background. Just asking myself, why am I not good enough? There were moments in my past where I couldn't look at myself in the mirror without thinking a hundred thousand negative thoughts about me. Welcome back to another episode of Through Help and Back. As you know, uh, we are focused on mental health, addiction, personal wellness, and health. We are so excited to have you here, so excited to be here today. Uh, we're in late September in New Hampshire, so we have this, this wonderful dual life going on where we've got some, some changing leaves and some red trees and some beautiful walks, but it's still like 75, 80 degrees out there, so we're kind of got a little summer vibe but a little fall vibe. So, you know, we have a topic today that I'm, I'm really interested in because I think it, you know, even though we t focus on mental health, psychology, and addiction, things like that, it's really about human development. It's about personal development, and I think our topic today is going to transcend the realm of just simple, you know, psychology or I'm dealing with a psychosis or I'm depressed or I'm anxious. We start talking about root causes and the things that we do uh, to get into those situations and to get out. And one of the big themes that's come up in my work over the years is this idea um, of really self-limitation, uh, self-sabotage. Uh, we've all had that experience where we kind of know the right thing to do. Uh, we can read all the books and get the lists, you know, here's five things to do to make this better. Uh, and then we just go out and we do the exact opposite or we don't follow through or we do something different. So why do we do that? So we're going to find out, hopefully. Uh, we have a, a wonderful healer, uh, a beautiful soul, a, an expert in this field. Uh, her name is Abigail Suazo, uh, which is an awesome name. And she is a trauma-informed hypnotherapist. So maybe don't listen to this while you're driving. Uh, she is an energy and frequency healer and a life activator. I'm excited to have her on because her work is centered around empowering individuals to awaken their true souls, uh, to find expression, uh, to step out and through limited mindsets and perspectives. And that's the piece that I really want to start on with her because I think if we can do that, it'll allow you know the energetic to influence the physical. And she's an expert in helping people embody their true soul and true self. So Abigail... I mean, that's a mouthful. Thank you so much for being here. Like, I can't wait to, to dig into all of that, but I'm really happy to have you here today. Thanks so much. Thank you. Honestly, the honor and pleasure is completely mine. Right. And so we always do this because we're really old guys. Like, you know, so the weather, like, where are you and how's the weather for you? Like, are you enjoying life? Are you still getting some summer vibes? Yeah, you know, I think us here in Long Beach, California are still enjoying that 70s weather. I think yesterday it got up to the 90s. So we're still very much enjoying a bit of that summer wave heat. Uh, not quite sure when the fall is going to decide to join us, but for now we're enjoying the sun. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's great. And so I'm interested in that, too, because I, I've never, you know, really spent extended time in California. Do you do you get a true fall? Do you get a true winter? Like, what's it like? Because I think the perception from us East Coasters is that you guys are just on the beach every day and, and life is good, right? <laughs> Yeah, you know, I think that in the fall, we're still at the beach. At winter, we'll, we'll cozy up. But I think Californians, at least myself, uh, even in 70s weather, I'm breaking out hoodies and sweaters and things like that. So yeah, I mean, for us, we experience our own particular kind of brand of fall. Uh, but I was born in Brooklyn, New York. So I remember those like really cold winters. I lived in Pennsylvania for a while, too. So yeah remember the snow. <laughs> See, I think that's nice to have that perspective though, right? Because like if you're born in a idyllic location, how do you ever like fully appreciate it? You know, you got to go through the, the dark winters to enjoy the bright summers, right? And isn't that true just in every aspect of life? <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Nothing's as sweet without the sour, right? So um, that's great. That's good to know. So I'll, I'll look forward to that because I tell you what, when it when it's 70 here, like we're I mean, there's no shirts. We're at the, we're at the lakes. So like we're going crazy. You guys are all bundled up. So, I mean, with the <laughs> t-shirts the start popping up around here around 50 degrees, you know, so we're just a different perspective. So tell me a little bit about, um, I always start off in this kind of in the same way. Tell me a little bit about your background and what, what drew you, you know, to become a healer or drew you into the, the healing arts. Tell me a little bit about what inspired you there. I was born to two immigrant parents who are very much like, in their um, very religious, very conservative, very much in the space of 
we are uh, going to navigate life a particular kind of way, and we really hope and expect our daughter to follow suit. And I feel like I grew up with a lot of people pleaser tendencies, a lot of tendencies of I really want to be the good daughter and I was the oldest. And so <clears throat> as I grew up, you know, like I said, I was born in Brooklyn, New York, uh, but I didn't stay there long. I ended up really being raised by partially by my grandparents in Antigua, Guatemala. And so we were down there for what was supposed to be three months, ended up being actually like four years it was due to immigrant, you know, statuses and paperwork and trying to become legal for my parents. And uh, I was kind of raised all over the place. It wasn't until later on in life uh, that I started to understand there are some really deep, deep wounds here. There's a lot of pain here because of different things that I've navigated through, uh, you know, and I really, I think at the end of 2019, I really started to put myself in a position where I looked at my surroundings and I began to question a lot of things. What am I doing with this life and why am I here? How did I end up here? Sort of felt kind of like, um, I believe it was Alice, right? Landing like in Wonderland and sort of being like, how, how is this my reality? I don't understand. And um that really began like the search and the seeking and this longing and hunger for um, allowing myself to break through a lot of things that I didn't realize were keeping me stuck and looped in, you know, certain choices and decisions in my life. I was married, young son, all these things that would beckon me to sort of stay in particular patterns and not move forward out of due diligence and responsibility and to have to decide and pick I need to place myself first so that I can then pour out into everyone in my existence and reality. And it came after an episode of wanting to commit suicide, attempting it three times and failing. Uh, and so early 2020 really met me in a space of uh, discovery. And spirituality was something that really assisted me through that. And I didn't realize that there was more beyond religion. I didn't realize that there was more beyond like constructs that we had created societally. Um, and I felt this amount of freedom and expression and being, and I wanted everyone to experience that. And so it, just, it, was, it became a huge catalytic moment in my life. Surely. And 2019 is not so long ago. I mean, that's you know, a recent transformation. So it's still probably very raw in some ways. Um, you know, you, you gave us a lot there, but I'm curious to go back before the kind of epiphany or, or transformation. I mean, did you feel that those people pleaser tendencies and those things in your family were, you know, oppressing you or causing damage along the way? Or did you only recognize and realize that damage retrospectively as you look back? You know what I mean? I'm wondering if you always had a sense that something was up or if it kind of came to you all at once. You know, the interesting part about this journey is that when we look at our life, like you mentioned in retrospect, um, we can see the patterning very clearly. But when we're very much entrenched in that maze of life, it is so difficult to actually witness the pattern unless someone outside of us sort of looks at us or signals to us to look further in, uh, to sort of witness what's going on, like they call it to our attention. And I think that at the time, um, number one, even if someone would have told me, I wouldn't have been open to listening. Um, and I think that within myself, there were signals that there were things not quite right. And I kept hitting the same wall over and over and over again. Um, the real revelation came in retrospect, you know, uh, there's this thing that I really like to tell clients of mine, you know, we center in, uh, through, uh, a particular created space, right? So your environment that's surrounding you, you can look at it and say, this is my truth. I am living as a married woman who's unhappy, um, a limited amount of, of resources, living in a particular neighborhood with the amount of friends and circles of friends that have their own behaviors and patterns. And we receive that as our truth. Um, that truth then echoes out to existence. This is our truth. This is our truth. This is our truth. It really mm -hmm. takes an individual just saying, actually, no, I don't accept this as my truth. I am stopping this pattern here. I'm stopping this looping here. And all of a sudden it, it sort of clamps 
that vibration right in its spot and it it is able to recreate it it's able to rewrite it and i felt like i got invited into that space uh in early 2020 that's what that's what really clicked it that's what really did it and nobody in my surrounding could understand it and so many had to like leave by the way it was it was a difference of narrative now when you say invited into that space how did that invitation appear was that the the issue that you talked about with the the suicidal ideation or was there what was the invitation and and what form did it take because of the event right of trying to commit suicide uh, there was a moment of clarity and it was so small just the tiniest bit of clarity and mind you i had been drinking alcohol popping pills doing all these things i'd written all the letters to my loved ones and in just an instant just a brief brief moment of texting a friend and and i wasn't trying to communicate with anyone and it wasn't a person that i normally would have leaned on or talked to i think that i just counted on the fact that they wouldn't be available <laughs> And uh, they replied right away. They, they, I don't know, something within them told them that something was going on. And this individual played a, such a key role in the catalyst of change for me because they understood what was going on. They had been there themselves. They came to my house. They didn't leave the phone until they arrived. Uh, and through that moment, then they invited me to certain events that they would go to. Uh, groups of people and friends. And so I started communicating with different, different people had different perspectives of life. And that was it. That's it. You found connection, you found your tribe and it was your way back. Yeah. So a question that pops up a lot, and, and I know this is not the, the focus of our conversation today, but it kind of with the limiting beliefs and things like that. Um, when it comes to suicide and being like, listen, I, I don't want to be here anymore. Or, I don't want to live like this anymore because that's the thought of suicide. It's not about wanting to be gone. It's about wanting to, to not feel this anymore. Um, you know, when people from the outside of the field, and I've been a therapist for 20 years, you know, I'm, I don't have that history. There's always that question of, you know, how could it get that bad? How could it get so far that you're just like, I'm done? And so can you shed a little light on that for people who haven't been there? I mean, I'm not asking you for speak for all survivors, but for you – was it accumulation effect, sort of a, the straw that broke the camel's back, something you had ruminated and thought about for many, many years? Or did this happen rapidly where you were just like, I got overwhelmed and this seemed like my only option? I'm curious how one gets to that place. Thank you for asking. Um, I had had suicidal thoughts uh, since I was nine years old. And it wasn't because there was anything inherently wrong with my existence. I was raised by two incredible parents, dedicated parents, hardworking parents, loving parents um, who had faults, right? Who had things that they weren't 100% uh, perfect at. Uh, but from the outside looking in, it definitely looked like as if there was a lot of beauty, you know, in that space. But there was also a lot of torment in my own mind, and things that I couldn't understand or comprehend. There was stuff that I was seeing. There was pain that I can feel very empathic, you know, as an individual. And I absorbed a lot of things without having an outlet or feeling as if I had an outlet of safety to be able to express out. And so, as you know, when the physicality of us, our mind, our body, our heart, takes on all of these energetic spaces and doesn't allow the space or room for it to breathe, for it to be released out, for it to be expressed out, your entire system shuts down because it's an overload. It's an overwhelm. So I had that beginning at nine, happened once again at uh, 14, uh, another instance again. And these weren't attempts. They were very, very like depressed states and just thought. Um, then once again, when I was around 19, uh, and then I think the last one prior to 2019 was around 23. Um, so from that period, once I got married, not that the thoughts went away, but they sort of numbed a bit. And so I was so distracted with being a wife and having this career and all these things that I would get sad and I have like little episodes of depression, but the suicide was kind of like muted in the background. I think that 2019, I had been through so much physically with my health, you know, I had been through surgeries, you know, all these different things that really put me in a, a stressful state. And uh, I kind of hit ahead with our finances, with the lack of attention in my marriage, with 
you know, witnessing what my life looked like and how unsatisfying it felt. And I just kept asking myself, like, why am I still fighting to stay here? What is actually the point of it all? Like, what are we doing all this for? And it just became very easy, even being a mother, even being a wife, even being a friend, a daughter, to just say, life would be better. People would be better without me here. I'd be better without me here. That's a very common thing I hear a lot from people who are contemplating is, and, and, and we can talk about whether this be, falls into those negative sort of self-limiting beliefs, but it's not so much about, because people from the outside looking in and be like, well, suicide is very selfish, right? Like you get out and everybody else gets all the pain, right? But inside you feel it's the exact opposite. My absence would bring relief to these folks, right? Yes, they would be sad. They'll go to the funeral. It's shocking. Mom's gone. But long term, they'll just be better off. They'll actually be happier without having to deal with me or carry this around. Yeah, at that point I did. I felt like I was being a burden to so many people. Uh, to, my, to my husband especially, I felt that I wasn't doing a good enough job uh, being a wife or a mother. You know, it just it was lack of everything, you know, and I didn't understand that it was it all had to begin within. It was all external for me back then. Norm MacDonald has a fabulous joke about suicide, which is a funny joke just by itself to have a joke about suicide. But he talks about that, how people say, like, I don't get it. I don't understand. You know, I, and he's like, you don't you don't you don't know about life. You don't know how it's like a constant struggle and ultimately ends in a catastrophe. Like you you don't. What do you, he's like, what what marshmallow house do you live in? You know what I mean? So um, and that's something that I think I, I tease Ian all the time. Ian's a, Ian's a great guy, uh, but he's, you know, he's a younger guy, right? We're not going to hold that against him. And what I try to talk to him about a lot of times when we have our conversations offline is like what day in and day out really feels like and looks like, right? Because social media and those types of things, life looks like a bunch of big moments. And there are other big moments. You know, there are the graduations. There are the weddings. There are the, you know. Uh, but there's also a lot of mundane, repetitive, day in and day out moments in between. And uh, it's, it's cool to do this stuff for social media, but if you're going to have a, a fulfilling life, forget happy, successful, and all those judgmental words. If you're just going to have a satisfying, kind of fulfilling life with meaning, you, you best learn how to navigate day in and day out um, because that's the majority of it. So, um, and amazing in your story that one text turned it all around. It wasn't the whole journey, but it, it set your trajectory in a different direction. So, um, t tell me what happens after that text. So did you decide, okay, this means something I'm not meant to leave and it just all changed or what was the process like after that text? How did you find your way back? You know, there's something that I love to, uh, speak on, which is the ministry of friendship and heart centered connection. You know, when people can actually look at you without the lens of judgment and criticism and also force and manipulation, you know, I want you, I expect you to be uh, A, B, C, D, E. Uh, instead, they're just looking at you and loving you for exactly who you are. The mess of you is perfect. You know what I mean? The light of you is amazing and the dark of you is is beautiful too. And um, I feel that that gets lost sometimes with people and it leads them into the, the these passageways of confusion and, and trying to constantly strive. So when he showed up in the way that he did and showed me that kind of unconditional love that I hadn't truly felt from anyone up to that point, for or maybe even for a while, right? Where I can feel safe to just be myself and be broken and be messy. Um, he introduced me to other people that were kind of emulating that same expression too. And it just kept going. March for me of 2020 was so uh, massive. We were about to get ready to enter into that whole COVID uh, state of mind and everything that was going on in the world. Um, but for me, it was such a massive transformation that was happening right prior to it. And I started going to these events, you know, with meditation. It was all online, like meditation and group gatherings and all these things. And I just started to feel within myself as if all of this stuff was resonating and awakening things that have happened within me in the past as a child. I remembered so much of this stuff, you know. And so uh, March moving into June, I was just in deep, deep, deep states of diving into myself um, having Reiki sessions, quantum regression sessions, hypnosis sessions, 
um, you know, uh, sound baths and all of these things because I was just hungry for it. I wanted to learn and experience everything. Um, and so from that point on, I just began to meet particular individuals, one uh, in particular that just assisted so much in awakening all of these different aspects within myself. I, I journeyed with a, a therapist and also a coach uh, that both assisted me in that space too. And I just felt like uh, I had always been someone that wants to help other people. But the intention of that, you know what I mean, had to be shifted. My why had to be understood a little bit deeper. Why was I doing this? It wasn't to help or save people. It was for myself. And during that time, that's what was awakening. I mean, you did your journey on expert mode, right? Because you you were craving connection and you were craving, you know, communication and you were craving places to anchor in reality. And the government said, everybody go home and be scared of everything, right? <laughs> 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 yeah. And for me, I was like, you mean I get to be in the house for who knows how long and just do work on myself? Phenomenal. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's true. Well, and, and what a beautiful reframe, right? Instead of instead of taking it as, oh, my gosh, I've been cut off from the world. You are approaching it as I get this time. This has been given to me and I can really immerse in these processes. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 there's, you know, between stimulus and response, right? Victor Frankl, between stimulus and response, there's a moment. And in that moment is your choice. And the choice is how to view what's happening to you, right? And that's the whole thing because the exact same thing could happen. And for a lot of people, um, you know, suicide went up. You know, depression increased, anxiety exploded. It's because the story that was told in that moment was, you know, bad, negative, limiting. And so their interpretation of events and their experience of those events, of course, became that. So um, what are what are two or three or, or one or two or whatever, when you think about the lessons you learned during that journey, because I'm hearing a lot of techniques, but I'm also hearing a lot of ins insight and awareness and enlightenment. What are the two to three lessons that you learned that really are like, man, I wish everybody could have this awareness. I wish everybody knew that blank. I think for me, one of the top lessons that was learned, one of the main things that I really like sat with during that time and I continue to is everything that I am navigating through isn't being done to me. It's being done for me. And on top of that, Everything that I'm experiencing is just myself reflected back. And that was a tough pill to swallow because I had to sit with so many aspects of my life. What do you mean? Like I wanted to enter into a marriage where eventually it would feel as if it was unrequited and uh, not reciprocated. What do you mean? I'm working a job that I don't truly enjoy and therefore I'm living an unfulfilling life. What do you mean? I'm having this challenge with my parents and my son and all these things. What do you mean? I created this. There's no way I ever would. And the more that I sat with it, it was like, mm, absolutely you did because you are addicted to chaos and you also have zero boundaries. And also you like and enjoy playing the victim. Be honest with yourself. So I had to really sit with all these aspects of myself where they had to land into the pool of truth within myself, you know, and I uh, was able to no longer witness my life as if I was just this singular character inside of it, but take the eagle as I perspective and really witness all of the characters that I had been playing in this existence so far. Those are hard things to hear about yourself, right? Much less realize and feel. Where does all that come from? You know, you, you've kind of done a little bit of mentioning of, of great parents and, you know, the expectations grow up in households. And, you know, uh, Gabor Mate has this idea that we're all experiencing trauma, right? You think a big T trauma is like, you know, sexual assault or battery or the things that are really dramatic. But there are a lot of little T traumas that we're basically all being raised in, even down to environmental toxins or, you know, the the curse of some of the social media stuff. So in your perspective, looking back, um, you were feeling suicidal thoughts since age nine. Um, can you trace it back now in retrospect and be like, here's where I got that idea or here's where this first started? Yeah, absolutely. I think in the last three years, a lot of that has come into my awareness. Um, I think the very first impactful wound that I had in my life, and mind you, I've been able to connect even certain patterns and wounds to the womb. Like when I was in my mother's womb and my mom's nervous system being completely shot and in fear and just 
chaotic because she never knew when my dad might be deported or not. And so she, when she might be deported, she's carrying a child. And so I was already in that environment from even that point. But consciously, the age of four, when I was dropped off at my grandparents' home in Guatemala, and my parents had to stay back in New York, they couldn't even physically take me to Guatemala because if they left the country, like that's it, they would be stuck. And they had this idea that they wanted to raise their family in the U.S. And especially the legalities and the, you know, uh, governmental environment of the 70s was one that was very intense. Um, and so from the age of four, I remember after doing a lot of deep work in that space, just asking myself, why am I not good enough? Maybe I need to do more in order for my parents to come back and claim me as their daughter. Like, they're my parents. They're supposed to be around, but even they don't want me. And that reflected in every romantic relationship I had and every job opportunity that I accepted and was, like, below what I was actually worth, you know. It reflected in friendships that were not of equal reciprocity. It's in everything. Yeah, and you and when that stuff gets in, you'd mentioned, too, like, you know, drinking and things like that. I mean, some of those numbing agents, you know, that's kind of the whole trick behind drugs and alcohol is it turns the volume up on what you like, but it also turns the volume down on what you don't like, you know? And so it's why feel this when I could just sort of go numb instead? Yeah. The euphoric state that you get from all of these different, um, you know, assistance, <laughs> you know, but I found, I found a lot of numbing in all sorts of stuff. I found numbing and, um, the internet and my phone. I found them, you know, through alcohol and uh, certain recreational drugs. Um, I even found it in food. I found it in shopping. I found it in gossiping with friends, you know, that I knew weren't meant to be in my life at that point. It's so many different avenues of escapism. The magic molecule, that dopamine, like whatever button we have to hit to get it, right? Um, <laughs> and, and how much, the, you know, and just to think about your story, like how much the perspective changes because, you know, this idea that like as an adult, when you're doing these things, people may view you in one way and be, you know, maybe harsh people are like, oh, just just get it together. You know what I mean? Like, what are you doing? But then when you tell that story of an abandoned four year old and wandering around in Guatemala, kind of like, why am I not good enough? Right. Like it immediately changes everything about how you feel about that situation. And I think what people need to understand is those are the same people. They're the same people, because if it's unresolved, you physically can be as old as you like, but emotionally, there you are, you know, and that's, 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 yeah, that's really tough. That's really tough. Yeah. I, I like to say that, you know, I was a 30 something year old married with a child, but I was a nine year old that was hurting constantly. And that's, that's from the space of what I would react from. I wasn't responding to life. I was reacting as a nine-year-old and all of my choices, all of my decisions, everything. So if things got challenging, I would hide and I would run away and I would avoid because that's what I did when I was nine. You know, um, if I was uh, put up in a corner, you know, and being challenged and I didn't like it, same thing. I would just run and I would hide. It's just that we, we don't we don't grow in physicality. We grow in mindset, you know, and in heart. Before we go on, I want to say a few words about Anew Behavioral Health. Anew Behavioral Health is an outpatient provider of mental health and substance abuse services in Ohio and New Hampshire. That means that Anew can successfully treat mental health and substance abuse issues or dual diagnosis if you're struggling with both. Their integrated approach allows for them to successfully address issues related to anxiety, depression, addiction, trauma, and really anything that stands between your life and the life you could be living. You really cannot bring them an issue that they have not successfully treated. They have also solved one of the biggest problems for people seeking help. They have a dedicated team waiting to hear from you at helpnow at anewbh.com. If you contact them today, within 24 hours, you will have heard back from, wait for this, a real live person and will also have your first appointment scheduled at that time. So how do you contact them? Well, if you're in Ohio or New Hampshire, you're probably close to one of their local locations. You're welcome to go in. If not, you can always reach them online at anewbh.com. And if you're interested in services for you or loved one, use that address, helpnow at anewbh.com. 
I, ra- I was raised Christian and am Christian to this day. And, you know, one of the things that resonates is the language, right? And so when they talk about in the Bible that we're all children of God, right? Um, and then you watch 40-year-olds, like you said, when you put them in the corner, they get that, you get your anxiety cranked up, you get your anger going, and they're like, they act like children, right? And so I, it, it, it's nice for me because I've interpreted it as a place where we're here to learn and we're here to develop. And even if you're 50 years old, you're 70 years old, you still have more to learn and you have more development to do. And so you are in that childlike state because none of us will ever achieve perfection, right? And maybe that's not even the goal. Maybe the goal this time around is to get 1% better in, in, a, in a way, right? And then continue to develop as you go through. So um, I think that's great. And Ian said that. He hates it when I put him in the corner. You should see how he acts. He just, like, freaks out. So. <laughs> <laughs> those, uh, those reels are late. Get in the corner. You know, and he, he hates it. No, I'm just kidding. I would, I would never. So um, time, maybe a rough question or maybe a great question. Um, with all this, am I enough? When will I be enough? Do you feel like you're enough today? Oh, absolutely. You know, I write a love letter to myself every single morning. Every single morning. And I stay in that state of, and and it it could be a challenging morning. It could be a morning where I don't want to get out of bed. It could be a morning where I am in an argument with someone or I'm having, you know, challenges of life being presented to me. And it, it might be more difficult on those days, but I even sit with, okay, I have a bed. Man, I have my home and I have my dog, and I have my son, and I have my friends, and I have my health, and I have my food. And I I start to think of it that way. And it no longer stays where I used to stay before, which was the victim of what was me, and my life sucks, and this and that, and whatever. And so if I am the love letter that I have been seeking, and I have been looking for in my entire life, why not write it myself to myself every day? Amazing. I'm I'm waiting for your website to drop. I want to I want to read these like, I mean, what a practice. (laughs) <laughs> you know, um, you know, it's one thing to meditate. It's one thing to kind of the thought exercises. And we talk about radical gratitude, staying in gratitude no matter what. And, but to have that physical manifestation and an action, right? So there's there's one thing. It's like it's like the classic make your bed, but on steroids, right? Like you have ste- you've taken a step towards appreciation and gratitude and put it into physical manifestation every day. It's got to be. It's what I was mentioning before. My reality can be showing me something. And if it's unsavory, now mind you, there's a difference between being initiated through challenge and things just actually sucking and just being like, I just don't like it. This is not good, you know, and I can take that power back from the thing that is challenging me or is creating this form of unsavory mess in my life. Um, And in taking my power back, it's by stepping through gratitude. It's my understanding that it's also in my hands. It's in my possession to sort of be like, you know what, Uh, through inspired action, I'm going to actually navigate into this direction now. And I'm going to feel really good about it. And I'm going to be patient about it too. Our society lacks patience. We really want things to turn around in the instant that, that we desire it. And not that it can't. The energetic um, north is already there, but we have to let the physicality catch up. We can get there with it, you know, and grow with it. Um, but that that's something that it took a long time to say with it. Some I still practice every day where I'm just like, I want to, but I'm going Sure. To. Yeah. Isn't it so easy? Isn't it so easy to slip into complaining and moaning and groaning and, oh, yeah. you know, and only finding the negative. And we, we covered this on an earlier show, like, uh, you know, 70%, if not 75, I think of the adjectives in the English language are negative. Right. And so whereas Eskimos may have a hundred words for snow, Americans seem to have a hundred words for bad, you know, and oh, by the way, not only are there more of them, they're more powerful. If you put them on the list, right, they draw, they draw the attention, uh, which is why the, the news is what the news is, because they're giving us what we will consume and we want the negativity and the scandal. And, but then when you rearrange that thought and you think about your relationship with yourself and you realize the only person you're ever going to have a conversation with for your entire life is yourself. Um, why wouldn't you want to take steps to make sure that that's a pleasant, you know, affirming conversation? But hard to do, easy to say, you know? Absolutely. But it's just like anything. It's like when you're going to the gym, it's a practice. It's a practice and you're not going to be perfect at it. And you shouldn't strive for perfection either. Right. You know, if you're creating a form of longevity or a legacy of mindset, let's say that, right? 
um, you wanted to start with those small steps every single day. So even if you're at a red light, my, my red light exercise is my favorite. I sit at a red light and I sit with the spaces of what I am genuinely uh, happy with in that moment and what things are bringing me joy in that moment, whatever that may be. It might be <laughs> like I'm stuck in traffic. Thank goodness I have extra time to just be with myself right now. Like, thank God, you know what I mean? And then it shifts every single aspect of the day. I'm no longer stuck in my sorrow. I'm actually championing for my joy. Very different. And stuck at the red light with somebody that you appreciate and enjoy now, not the person that you found to be deficient and not good enough, right? Uncomfortable silence was because you were uncomfortable with yourself. Now you can cherish it because it's somebody you like. You genuinely like him. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. There were moments in my past where I couldn't look at myself in the mirror without thinking a hundred thousand negative thoughts about me. I'm a terrible person. Look, my my wrinkles, my weight, my hair, my this, my that, blah, 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 blah. It was so much criticism about myself. Um, now I, I, I enjoy looking at who's looking back at me. I pour so much love into her and into the versions of her that have existed in the past. You know, they need my love the most because she was hurting the most and she did the most so that I could be here, you know, and acted like she deserved the love the least. And isn't that the paradox? The people who need the love and attention the most often act like, or, you know, behave in a way that makes you think they deserve it the least. Um, But when you believe that behavior is communication, you can start to kind of see through that a little bit, you know? I like your red light exercise better than mine. I like to sit there and like text and cuss. I mean, that's, I'm mean, just like, ah, what am I doing? You know, this, every, everybody's in my way. I, you know, let's go. Let's go. How long have we been sitting here? You know, so. Well, it's either that or I'm singing to my favorite song. I mean, you're going to catch me dancing in my car at least once. <laughs> we do know about your musical background. We won't completely out you here right now, but I'm just saying if people want to, uh, I want to do a little research. There's some uh, there's some musical talent there that you might find. So, um, so this is great, and, and and congratulations on your progress and your continued progress. I mean, that's you know, it's a wonderful story because as a therapist for 20 years, that's really what I want. I don't want to fix anybody, but I want to equip them with the tools so they can go out and live that meaningful life and continue to work on self without me. You know, as a therapist, my number one goal was always to become unnecessary right? You know, you come in and get what you need. Now go live your life with these tools. It's the classic teach a man to fish, you know, kind of situation. Um, Yeah. So with your clients, that's what I was going to transition to with your clients. I mean, I'm sure they come in with versions of I'm not enough. I see that you are enough. I want to get there. How do you, how do you help them get there? I have a monthly coaching program that I assist a a bunch of different individuals. I also do one-on-one sessions uh, with people and it really depends on what it is that they're looking for. Um, When a client comes to me, like you mentioned, they're coming out of a state of, I really want to change. You know, I really want uh, these things in my life to shift. And there's aspects of you that resonate with me. There's messages that you have put out that resonate with me. I want to learn more. And so we use different modalities. Um, Like you mentioned, I'm a certified trauma informed, uh, you know, psychologist plus hypnotherapist. And I use a lot of those modalities to assist. And we begin, you know, in a monthly program. Um, And for me, um, it's not about the longevity of it. It's um, how can we meet you exactly where you are and and where you can get yourself to the point of where you feel I have a form of groundedness. I am integrating, I am embodying, and here I go, you know, and I'm ready to meet life where life is meeting me and actually create something for myself that I'm going to enjoy, that I'm going to be proud of, and that's going to be honorable to who I truly am. That's a word that's tossed around a lot, but how does trauma-informed, you know, what does that mean to you and how does it work its way into your practice? I got my certification actually about a a year ago uh, when it came to that. Uh, And it came from a state from I had navigated my own sexual wounding uh, with rape and, uh, you know, molestation and things like that. And so I really wanted if I was going to navigate my practice, I wanted to understand language, you know, of being able to assist people who have navigated similar wounds and patterns. And so um, through that, it's really assisted me to see not just from what I've navigated through, like my own personal perspective and things like that, which that part obviously is already innate, but I wanted to actually understand the psychology behind trauma. I wanted to understand like, 
how our body responds, our nervous system, the hippocampus, like all these things when it comes to actual trauma, what's being triggered and ignited within ourselves as we're navigating these challenging things so that I can assist my clients better, you know. Do you find it easier or do you find it more challenging to work with people who have also undergone sexual trauma just because of what that can flare up in yourself? Easier, uh, to be honest with you. I... I don't get a lot of people that have navigated necessarily sexual trauma, but a lot of people that have navigated mother wounding, father wounding, the the patterning that kind of gets evoked from that. I get a lot of people have dealt with abandonment and rejection, uh, self-worth, self-love uh, things, you know. And so, um, but anytime that someone has come to me with some kind of sexual trauma, it's easier to just see eye to eye and also to show them like, I not only understand I've been there and I've walked this path alongside of you. And so here's some things that I learned and let's see if it resonates and let's make it your own. What works for me isn't necessarily going to work for you. And that's okay. It's nice for those clients to that you're a living testimony to the survivorship and thriving despite, you know what I mean? It's sort of like you're a living example, even if they don't like your techniques or your lessons, it's like she made it through, you know, and I could do that too. Um, when you say molestation, that typically implies younger age and then sexual trauma older. Um, I just always find that so fascinating too, that, you know, and you talked about lack of boundaries, how things as a child that can terrify us and hurt us and scare us, those patterns tend to repeat into adulthood, right? You would think that if your father drank, it scared you, he was tossing stuff around the house, passing out, you'd be like, I'll never touch alcohol. But it almost has this weird, like, hypnotic effect where it almost attracts us when we're older, almost as if it's like, well, I can go through this as an adult and maybe process this better, you know what I mean, or kind of challenge yourself or that kind of thing. So did you have some of that going on where you felt like, you know, did you have those moments of, like, cognitive dissonance where it's like, I know this as a child, but here I am as an adult. Like, I mean, how did you kind of reconcile both of those experiences for yourself? Molestation for me did happen when I was much younger, and it was a suppressed memory. And it wasn't until later through hypnotherapy that a lot of these memories got awoken. And so... Uh, I began to understand why I was magnetizing particular uh, dynamics into my life, like men, even certain friendships, the relationship I had with my mother, with my father, with my brother, um, all of these things. And it was at that point where through the act of awareness, right, um, I was able to shift that within myself. I no longer, and, and again, that awakens your worthiness. What do you feel you're worthy of? And also your boundaries. What does your yes mean? And what does your no mean? And what actually is something that you want in your life? And how far are you willing to take it? You know, and um, it was in that moment where I just began to say no to a lot of people and to a lot of things. I began to say no to myself. Because there was a lot of self-sabotaging habits and tendencies within myself. I was constantly chasing emotionally unavailable people. And I married one. I married someone that, to me, was emotionally unavailable, but available to everything and everyone else. And so even though he would be present sometimes, it wasn't a constant thing. But I wasn't being consistent with myself. So therefore, it's a repeated pattern. It's just it's, it's all mirror. It's all a big, big, big mirror reflecting back to you, trying to show you this is just where you are. First of all, I want to thank you. Um, I love that phrase, magnetizing these situations. I'm going to steal that and I'm going to use that in like all my sessions because I've tried to find a way to describe like, you know, you put a victim on one side of the, the room, you put a victimizer on the other, they find their way to each other, period, end of story. And the best I've always said is, especially in people in early recovery is, is like, look, you, you, your, your picker is broken. You're a bad picker right now, right? So don't trust yourself because the things that you're going to like are not going to be good for you in the short term as you heal, right? So don't trust your picker. And I would always say, like, first thought wrong, right? So if you're like, ooh, that's the guy. Careful, first thought wrong. There's a reason because you've got a broken picker, right? Like something's telling you. That's the old stuff. But I love that magnetizing those situations because that's how it feels. I mean, the people would come back into session and say, I know I shouldn't have. I knew I didn't want to, but I almost felt pulled kind of into the situation without my effort, just like, here I go again, you know? It's our addiction to chaos at the end of it, you know what I mean? And it is the, like you mentioned, the dopamine that we get so addicted to. Somebody's abandoning me, therefore the chase begins. And now I want to seek external validation and I want to um, have someone 
tell me that I'm worthy so that I don't have to do the work around it. I want someone to tell me that they love me so I don't have to love myself fully. I want someone to, it's always so external. And when really the work is always within, you know? And so we will continue to create a space for those people to enter and to be invited into the home that we have created for ourselves. And I always like to say the airport only lands. I mean, the plane only lands at the airport that is calling them in. Right. And that's you are an airport that's calling all of these connections in and saying, <laughs> hey, I got space for you. And even if it looks like I don't, I promise I can make some. You're good. <laughs> come on. Come on. Wave them in. I'm picturing like, the guys <laughs> with the lights. You know what I mean? Line them up. So um, I, I'm curious about this. So you're kind of I can't I think you're kind of in this realm and you're kind of talking about it. But boundary work specifically. Um, how do you approach that and how do you kind of conceptualize that for your clients? Is it a lot of those type of analogies or how do you first get to a place where you're like, okay, it is the lack of boundaries that's creating this. You're not just the most unlucky person on the planet. Like you're creating this and you're inviting it in. So how do you conceptualize boundaries for your clients and how do you get that process started where they can kind of recognize the value of setting boundaries? Because I've experienced that when people first start setting boundaries, they think they're missing out or that they're losing out. They don't see the great benefit down the line. So how do you deal with that? I had to understand it for myself first because I lacked it so severely. It's something that I'm still practicing today. And so it's funny because there'll be moments where I'll be journeying with clients and I'll sit with what I'm saying. And I'm like, am I actually practicing this for myself? You know, I think it's important to do a bit of self inventory and just sit with like some of those spaces where you are a little bit in the gray scale, you know, uh, it isn't so definitive. And I think that's where we get um, caught up in certain situations that are very unsavory. It's uh, the, it is what it is mindset. You know what I mean? There are certain things where that absolutely applies, but when it comes to your boundaries, there should be a certainty about what it is that you are willing to invite into your life. And so uh, with my clients, I like to look at the, the root of patterning first. I want to see where these things first began so that we can understand where boundaries get to be set. Not where they have to be set, but they get to be set so that they assist us through this journey and they assist the connections that are in our life. Our, our connections are really going to flourish by these boundaries that we set. They're not going to lack. They're not going to lack anything. And any connection that is dissolved by you creating a boundary was just taken advantage of you and honestly doesn't need to be a part of your existence. Uh, so it's sort of inviting uh, my clients into the space where they shift the perspective of what a boundary actually looks like and how it benefits versus harms or removes. Nature is perfect in many ways. And it's funny that so much of our progress lives behind what we won't do, not what we will do, right? Or what we won't eat versus what we will eat. Like everybody's looking for the magic pill and everybody's looking for like all that. And a lot of times it's like, just get the toxicity out. Like stop, stop doing damage and let nature take its course. And you'll be amazed at how far uh, and how fast you can progress. Um, so I think we have the conversation backwards sometimes, you know what I mean? It's like, uh, will this hurt me? It's like, no, no. How does this help me? Right. And if it doesn't help me, it doesn't get to be included, you know, and you don't need three co-signers for that. Like you can just say, no, this doesn't work for me, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that's a big step for the clients that I've seen is getting to a place where they understand that they can just say that. And it, that's, that's enough. Uh, boundaries are a notification, not a conversation sometimes, you know, and, and that's and that's hard. That's hard to realize. It's scary to do it the first time. Right. Because here oh, comes all terrifying. that rejection. Yeah. Here comes again. Oh, it's terrifying <laughs> because someone that lacks boundaries has navigated through a form of survival, you know, in their childhood where they did feel abandoned and rejected. And therefore, they stepped into the archetype of people pleaser. And so the people pleaser doesn't want to set up boundaries because they feel like they are hurting the other person by doing so. But who they're hurting the most is themselves. And so the moment that we begin to exercise these modalities within ourselves, that we begin to exercise, saying yes and letting no just be no without any kind of, you know, explanation, uh, as uncomfortable as it is, you feel the relief. You feel the freedom that is found in being able to express yourself fully and honestly uh, and not being afraid of your honesty and what uh, impact it'll have on those around you. How do you deal with uh, relapses, behavioral relapses? You'd mentioned earlier, like you struggle with this yourself. So personally and professionally, what happens when 
all those all these best laid plans and all these uh, desired interventions fall apart, and you do let somebody cross your boundaries, or you do relapse into old negative behaviors, or even into negative self talk. Right? What happens when your love letter shows up and it's like, no, nah, actually, I don't like you too much today. So how do you how do you deal with that? I allow myself to be human. I really do. I am not here to be robotic. I'm not here, like I mentioned prior, I'm not here to strive towards any kind of perfect idealization of my life. I allow myself to be the spectrum of Abigail. And I accept my highs being my highs. I accept my lows being my lows, understanding that I am met in all of those spaces. And so uh, when a quote unquote relapse happens in my life, and they do, you know, I show myself a lot of compassion a lot of softness. I cry it out. I'm a big crier. So I cry it out. I, I, um, I don't set up like this kind of contingency list. Okay. Now we are in, (laughs) we are in high alert. You missed the call and you messed up and no, I, I'm I'm not going to do what I did to myself in childhood and what was done to me in childhood, which was a lot of criticism. I just, uh, I'm very soft about it. I'm like, Hey, you know what? For one moment, all right, you messed up and that's okay. You needed this, believe it or not, as, as painful as this, as this seems, as whatever, you needed the reminder that we get to enforce them just a bit stronger next time. And that's OK. I reparent myself through it a lot. Gotcha. Yeah. So we're now we're back to this is happening for me, not to me. Right. That's the that's one of the foundational beliefs. Yeah. Always. Oh, I had a terrible argument, you know, um, like maybe a month ago uh, with someone, you know, that plays an important role in my life. And I sat with that and I hadn't been in that energy in so long. We're talking like years. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I hadn't been angry, like genuinely angry where it was like coming off in the way that it was. And I remember driving home crying just because it wasn't me, like the me that I've been used to now. Right. It wasn't that version of me that I really enjoy. And it started off really angry. And I was like, God, you're a loser. Look at you. This is awful. Like you messed up. And there you go again. And they're, what are they going to think? I just went crazy. And then I just stopped. And I was in the car. I parked in front of my house. I was wiping away my tears. And I remember the moon was out and just looking at it and thinking to myself, yeah, but look at you now actually understanding what that is. And now we can actually do something about it. You know what? And so I sat, I placed my hands on my heart. And I was just like, I forgive you. I forgive you. I forgive you. I still love you. Like, that's okay. You're, you're safe here. You are safe here. It's just, it it had to be like, what would I want my mom to do right now? What would I want my dad to do right now? What would I want a significant other to do for me right now? What would I want the me that is a year from now, five years from now to do for me right now? Because I need her right now. Uh, and the, these versions of me needed me, this version of me right now, too. It's so profound because it, you're speaking directly to this internal locus of control. And people will say that. They'll say, I just wish somebody would say blank to me, right? Like you're safe, you're pretty, you're enough, whatever. But you can say that to you, you know? You can say it to you. And we make things so complicated and we go out there searching for all the stuff that, that lives here and, and lives here right now. You know, and yeah, it'd be great if, you know, an attractive significant other that you were really digging said it. That's cool. Like, we like that. I mean, yeah. We're not against it. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not against it. We're open to that. <laughs> it's cool to have wants, like, we are human, right? But, but our needs can be met internally, right? And that's where I think people get tripped up a lot of times is, uh, they get into need based relationships instead of want based relationships. Cause when you're in wants, you have a choice. You know, I, I want, I, you know, I want a new truck. I don't need it. Right. It'd be cool to have, but I don't need it. So I'm not going to fall apart behind it. You know what I mean? But if I start treating it like a need, well, now it's an everything must go sale. Right. I'll do anything for something that I need, even if it means compromising myself or, you know, things like that. And then the other thing I was really uh, impressed to hear is when you said that's not me anymore. So through these micro actions, what's changed is actually your identity. You're literally a different person behind it, right? Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. And so those things don't fit. All those things you're trying to get rid of, they just don't fit anymore because that's not me. Um, where when you first started this, the first positive love letter you wrote yourself, you probably felt like that was weird. That's not really me. Right? And now you're right. <laughs> felt like a lie. It felt like a lie. But I had to remember that the person that was writing that letter was nine. That's right. Oh, trying to speak to a 30-something-year-old. 
And so I think about anytime my son, who's 12 now, tries to talk to me, I will understand from the level of what he is trying to express, but also understanding that he's 12, that he's 12. So every version of me that has, you know, been birthed from the acts of awareness and consciousness and all these tools and healing, et cetera, um, it was my energy. It was my emotional equivalent growing with it. So it's like now the individual that's talking to me is speaking a very different language. It's tapping into a different vernacular that my actual physicality, mindset, heart, energy can understand. I am no longer in the space of why are you acting like a child? Why are you thinking like a child? Why are you? Da, 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 da? It became like a more now, now more observant about my life. Now, before I do anything, there's a level of pause before it where I don't feel like I have to rush through everything. So it's a reactionary state. It's a response to life. I don't have to react to it anymore. I get to take that power back within myself, right? You're in the driver's seat. You know, you're not just along for the ride. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, sometimes I'm both. You know what I mean? Sometimes I am just watching what I created and I'm just like, well, isn't that lovely? This is this is incredible. Wow. Look at that. I, I created a space where I am, you know, now a psychologist and, you know, a therapist and this and that and whatever. And sometimes I'm driving and I'm just like, you know what? This is great. But, you know, what else is great over here? Let's go over here. And just it depends how I want to view it. Which is great, too, because that's also a privilege, you know, to not have to be drawn into instant emotional reaction. You know, I think that's one of the big maturity steps is realizing you don't have to react on an emotional level to everything that happens around you. But you, but early on, you feel like you do. You know, yes. it's, he can't get away with this. She can't talk to me like that. Why did that? Oh, my gosh. You know, and you're like, boom, boom. You're just riding that emotional roller coaster all day long. Some things you can just let pass by. A hundred percent. But you don't understand that when you feel like you're being chased by a metaphorical bear. Of course. Of course. When your whole life and your whole existence feels like survival. I have to live. I have to survive. So therefore, uh, what are our responses? Right. And we navigate this fight, flight, be still. Most of us are in the states of stillness when things like that happen and we freeze. We're just like, you know, oh, my God. Uh, but there will be moments where you want to run and react and fight and just, uh and that's that evolution. That's like getting past the surviving to the thriving, right? Like, let's actually make investments. And Amazing. Amazing. I could go all day. It's so good. This is like the fastest hour there's ever been. Um, uh, you know, Abigail, I want to be respectful of your time. But how do, people, how do people find you? How do they connect with you? Absolutely. So you can find me on Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, Twitter, threads. Uh, yeah, Energy Light Healing. Uh, my website's being updated, but you know, energy light healing on all social media platforms. Uh, you'll find me there. And when should they look for you? Who are the type of people that you either like to help or most benefit from your work? If they're struggling with A, B, and C. I think that if you're struggling with uh, understanding uh, life's purpose and direction, understanding, you know, where your patterns of limitation and scarcity lie, uh, where some of these traumas like first begin, um, I would love to touch base with you. I would love to assist you uh, to sort of awaken uh, these spaces within yourself, you know. All right, Ian, did you get all that down? Did you, did you, le you learned a lot? Okay, he's feeling enlightened over there. So we're feeling like we made some great progress. So. The, the <laughs> love letter to self, that that I need to do more of. I'm uh, very critical of myself at times. And I just want to thank you so much for that. That really made a difference for me. Yeah. Oh, Ian, I'm so glad. Yeah. To me, journaling, writing as a whole is such a modality that I love. But, you know, for some of my clients, it's voice notes. They love to, to talk to themselves. Mm -hmm. And we understand mm -hmm. where that trauma comes from. But some of them just want to it, it's easier to just record it and hear it back because then they're listening to themselves actually express this, you know, however it works for you, you know, uh, but write it to yourself every single day, even if it's just right right here where you're thinking it and saying it out loud. Another thing I'm grateful for is what you said about boundaries and kind of ex how you explained why sometimes we don't set boundaries and how that might be coming from a place of hurt. Because in the past, even as, as children, maybe we feared setting boundaries because we were either afraid of getting hurt ourselves or hurting someone else. And think about children who try to set a boundary, right? They say no, and, and an adult just barrels through that boundary like it doesn't even matter mm. so what have you learned what have you learned about the power of your voice and whether you matter and whether you even really exist there was no point in me trying to set that boundary right um, yeah and so that's 
the first lens we see the world through. And the first lesson that we get is you can say what you want, but it doesn't matter. That can be translated into I don't matter very quickly. Mm-hmm. We're raised under invalidation. You know, and we're raised in states of um, instead of people putting themselves in our place, they want to put us in our place. Mm. And that is very difficult to overcome when you're an adult, because then, you know, you'll either uh, be very much like in the shadows of who you think you are meant to be, or you're going to also uh, repeat the pattern. I'm going to bulldoze everyone that, that is in my existence and, you know, be very aggressive towards life. And then that the classic bully at school, right? And then somebody punches him back and you find out that he's just a sad, hurt kid who's getting bullied at home. I mean, it's just like, this is how I get power is, was the lesson, right? And it's very hurtful. Yeah, everyone we're talking to is navigating something. Um, and when you're talking to them, I think it's really good to ask yourself, um, what age are they responding from and what age am I responding with? You know, how, what age am I reacting from? Am I being like the 30, the 20, the 40, whatever year old that I say I am, or, or is this, is this a wound? Is, am I, am I reacting from a space of hurt when I was 10? You know, it changes everything because then everyone in your existence, you actually see them clearer and you're not seeing them under the lens of, I expect you to be like this because this is what was expected of me. Well, and I will, I will give you, I mean, we, we've known each other a long time now, Abigail, we go way back, but I will, I will say, you know, real recognizes real here for people who are considering connecting with Abigail. I would say uh, the the biggest five-star endorsement, because as a therapist, Abigail, your interventions are on point. They are rock solid. Like they're so creative, but they're so impactful. Right. And I think a lot of times healers can kind of sniff each other by their, the level of their interventions, right? Like, what would you do in this case? And if they're just like, I don't know. I just kind of do some stuff. You're like, no, do this, do that. And they are, they are to the point, like impactful interventions. So uh, for whatever this is worth, you know, this and a dollar will buy you a Coke, but I fully endorse your work because these interventions are, I mean, the stoplight intervention is like, I'm going to do that, like without a doubt. Um, So it's clear when we say eye to eye, it's clear you've been there. It's clear you've lived this and it's clear, you know, what you're talking about when it comes about, you know, interventions that can get people on a path towards healing and just understanding things in a different way. So congratulations on, on your development. Those are, those are legit. So, um, I'm very impressive. So thank you so much. I think I'm going to go to FedEx right now and I'm going to print out, uh, I am endorsed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, Ian and Jason. Don't ask me car. <laughs> we sell those, just so you know. I mean, okay. <laughs> okay, so everybody listening right now, hop onto the store. We are all endorsed. <laughs> That's right. You can get, we, we put a little gold circle. We put a little gold sticker on it, and it's 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 amazing. So yeah, uh, through helping back endorsed. But no, listen, Abigail. Seriously, we'll wrap up. But thank you so much for your time. Uh, I, I there's I'm I'm absolutely convinced somebody's heard this. And your podcast is going to be like that text message that you received that one day, and it's going to send somebody down a different path. Um, it's And isn't that the whole point? Thank you so much. Honestly, this was the most fun I've had in a while. It, this was incredible. Thank you. That just tells me you need to get out more, but thank you so much for being here. So. <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> No, that's good. Abigail, thank you so much. Ian, as always, smooth sailing when Ian's at the at the helm of the ship. So, And for you guys watching at home, always uh, much love and gratitude and appreciation to you guys. I say it every episode, but it, it remains to be true. Time is your most valuable asset. Uh, we're so appreciative that you chose to share this time with us. Um, I got a lot out of this. I, I hope you got one or two things that um, send you on a different trajectory. And I hope, you know, Abigail's overarching message that you are enough. Uh, resonates because I think that's a lesson that we all need to learn. And if we've learned it, we probably need to relearn it because day in and day out, that's a tough thing to keep front of mind uh, when life shows up and your boss says this and your kids say that and traffic says this and even your dog barks at you. Uh, to be understanding that all things happen for you, uh, not to you, and to carry Abigail's message for you, I think is a real blessing. So thank you for being here. Um, and until next time, take care of yourself and take care of each other. Thanks. 
Hey guys, although Through Help and Back is an excellent podcast with a lot of great ideas, I do want to let you know that in no way is Through Help and Back expected to be perceived as or relied upon in any way as specific medical advice or mental health advice for you personally. The information provided through Through Help and Back on our website or our podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment that can be provided by your own providers. Do not use our content in lieu of professional advice given by qualified medical professionals and do not disregard professional medical advice or delay seeking professional advice because of the information you have read on our website, heard on our podcast, or otherwise received from us. Although we love discussing issues related to health care, mental health, and addiction, we are not providing direct health care, mental health care, medical, or nutrition therapy services. We're not attempting to diagnose, treat, prevent, or cure in any manner whatsoever any physical or psychological ailment, any mental or emotional issue, disease, or condition. We are not giving you specific medical, psychological, or religious advice whatsoever. Please take care of yourself and take care of others as you always seek the advice of your own medical providers and your own mental health providers regarding any questions or concerns you have about your specific health or before implementing any recommendations or suggestions from us. These are ideas that have worked for other people. We think it's important to share them. We do not guarantee that they will work for you specifically. Do not stop taking any medications without speaking to your physician nurse practitioner, physician assistant, mental health provider, or any other healthcare or medical professional. And if you have or suspect that you have a medical or mental health issue, contact your own healthcare provider promptly. Also, one last thing, if you know or suspect that you are currently experiencing a crisis, it is absolutely imperative that you seek the advice of your doctor or other emergency healthcare services prior to ever thinking about using our content. We love the conversations. We're glad you're stopping by. We hope you take a lot from the content. But again, for your specific individual medical situation, please always seek quality personal care from your own providers. Do not let this uh, information or this advice stand on its own. Thanks so much for listening.